Hello guys, hello and welcome. Super glad to be here. This is my first time speaking at DEF CON. Very humbled to see so many people. Thank you guys for coming. So I heard there might be some problems with the projector, so I do apologize uh, about that uh, in advance. So without further ado, let's jump into some practical Cisco switch exploitation. So I'm a penetration tester at Kaspersky Lab. Um, I'm also a skydiver, so if any of you guys skydive, raise your hand. No one? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> so, uh, long story short, um, I'll be talking about um, a critical vulnerability published by uh, Cisco Systems on March 26, and it announced that um, around 300 uh, different models of uh, Cisco switches were vulnerable to an uh, unauthenticated uh, code execution vulnerability. And the uh, advisor also said that there are no signs of uh, exploitation in the wild. There's no public exploit available. So um, there I was uh, one quiet evening just writing one of those pen test reports when I decided to take a break, uh, go to my Twitter feed, and um, I all of a sudden I stumbled upon a tweet about the critical vulnerability, about the Cisco advisory. So here what, here's what I saw. Red, critical. So we got a CVSS score of 9.8. And uh, in a nutshell, this uh, was about um, a remote code execution via a telnet service in Cisco switches. And that happened uh, because of two major uh, problems. Uh, there was a failure, um, yeah, about clustering. Um, Cisco switches um, might be uh, joining clusters. And um, surprisingly enough, they are using Telnet for um, communication between cluster members. And um, that's not just a play in Telnet, they're using some of their specific uh, options, cluster management protocol options. And um, also these options are not correctly parsed on the server side. So um, this, uh, according to the advisor, this leads to remote code execution. So the vendor advice is uh, disable Telnet which is a solid advice actually because you know that um, Telnet is an old legacy protocol. Um, it's been superseded by SSH. Uh, okay, do you hear me now? Okay, that's better. <laughs> so Telnet is a legacy protocol which uh, been superseded by SSH like uh, 20 years ago. And now, according to the advisory, you can now get access to a Cisco switch through it. Um, is it really serious? Uh, no public exploit, uh, no knowledge of exploitation. So, guys, challenge accepted. That's why security researchers are here. So, I'll walk you through uh, the process of creating a working exploit uh, for these switches. And uh, to start off, um, the first thing I did is uh, research uh, the information is available uh, in the public about this vulnerability. And basically there are two things uh, up for grabs. Uh, one is the Cisco advisory that I was uh, just talking about and the other one is the original source of information, the Vault 7 leak uh, that happened in uh, March of 2017. Um, and that is um, actually the source for Cisco systems uh, themselves, uh, they, that's where they got the information about the vulnerability. So this um, leak uh, affected many vendors uh, like uh, Microsoft, Apple, and Cisco. I decided to sweep through the pages of, uh, of this leak myself to find something. I'll, I honestly was hoping to find some kind of exploit there or at least a step-by-step -step explanation of what's going on. But no, it was even a challenge to um, find the pages themselves because everything is codenamed. Uh, and the code name for this exploit is uh, Rosen. I don't know what it means. Um, and all I got uh, were the testing notes for it. So the tiny bits of information that I got from uh, the World 7 is that it works uh, in three ways. It has um, three ways of operating. It's set, unset, and interactive mode, uh, which brings us to the set mode. 
So they run a sc uh, script that basically um, turns off the um, authentication on Telnet connection. And after that, all the subsequent connections to Telnet uh, are credential less. So you just uh, pop our level 15 uh, Cisco IOS shell. The onset is completely opposite. You just um, get the authentication page back and all subsequent connections require, require password. And the, the most interesting one is interactive mode. So you run the exploit, you immediately uh, get a shell, no subsequent connections are affected. So this is my guess uh, from the Vault 7 pages. I don't know how it exactly worked, but I assume they work this way. So I decided why not do the same? Uh, I had two Cisco switches available. I just needed to cluster them up. Uh, dump some traffic uh, in cluster configuration and I hope to get a working exploit. So this is how I felt at the beginning. But you know that uh, the life is harsh and I look like this actually. So guys, uh, a few words about um, clustering those switches. So this is a way to actually uh, centralized way to administer uh, several Cisco switches. You have a master switch and you have a several slave switches. Uh, and, you, and you just um, log on to a master switch and uh, you are able to pop up a shell from any of the slave switch from the shell of the master switch. So this is kind of what it looks like. If you log into the master switch with a uh, level 15 privilege, you will get a level 15 privilege shell on a, uh, on a slave switch. And the uh, switches uh, are doing this by uh, discovering themselves on the L, uh, L2 network. They're broadcasting CDP packets. Uh, and they're building up tables of possible candidates for clustering. So um, you add a master and slave switch and then you are able to run the R command command which pops your shell. So I was running Wireshark uh, during uh, running this command uh, and testing all this. And the advisory, you remember, said that there's a telnet going between this uh, master and slave switch. So I look up uh, the workshop and <laughs> what do I see? Where's telnet? <laughs> no telnet. Some, some fancy unknown L2 protocol. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. Telnet? No, no telnet. So um, I was really unhappy and um, almost closed the Wireshark window but then I decided to tie some more com commands uh, into the shell and I actually observed that there is Telnet uh, in the traffic. Uh, and what, what's funny is this L2 protocol actually encapsulates IP protocol where the source and destination is, are not IP addresses but chopped MAC addresses of the Cisco switches. And uh, of course in IP packets there are TCP packets and uh, port 21 and we got Telnet inside. Okay, okay then I said. Um, next thing I was uh, looking at the traffic for some uh, anomalous uh, uh, traffic of Telnet but uh, everything was the same as the, with the generic Telnet connection ex except for the uh, initial handshake. Uh, you know uh, Telnet before you are uh, presented with a credential with um, uh, credential prompt uh, and the shell, the server and client are negotiating uh, the options. And um, what's interesting this, uh, there is that uh, I found an interesting uh, string flowing uh, between the server and client and it says Cisco kids. So we have to remember this string is this proved to be an important string. Back to the Vault 7. Uh, one of the important bits of information that I got there there was notes of some engineering engineer uh, testing the exploit. Uh, of course, no exploit was available at Vault 7. But uh, this was um, kind of an um, error log for is a Telnet debug from Cisco and it says that this is some kind of anomalous output. And we see the same string that I observed in, uh, in the Wireshark dump, Cisco kits. Uh, since this is track 101, here's a Telnet commands and options 101. Uh, this Cisco kit string was transferred as a part of a sub-negotiation option of Telnet. Um, it can be used to transfer custom parameters um, before the Telnet session. Well, I decided to, to go the easy way and I was sure I will get uh, a shell easily and I just replayed uh, the traffic into a generic Telnet connection but no, it doesn't work. I'm still presented with a 
credential check. And if you look thoroughly through the Cisco advisory page, you can see that they actually have an IPS rule for this vulnerability, and it's called Cisco IOS buffer overflow. <laughs> what does this sound like, guys? It's time for some reverse engineering. All right, so uh, if you want to reverse engineer, you, you might want to get the firmware out of the switch. Easy. Uh, you just log into the switch, uh, you list the contents of a flash directory. There's always uh, a firmware uh, there. Cisco switch has a copy command which is able to copy the firmware uh, to an arbitrary FTP server, so getting the firmware is pretty easy. What does the researcher do with the firmware? Of course, bin walk. Uh, no problems here, uh, uncompressed into a 30 megabyte binary. Um, well, things are going good, I thought. But, no. Every reverse engineer knows that when you open up IDA Pro and it shows this tiny, thin column, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> IDA did not recognize it, of course it didn't. But jokes aside, um, this um, firmware is PowerPC 30 bit. It's easily, you can look it up in Google uh, that Cisco switches are running uh, PowerPC. It's no big secret. And the entry point, the actual address of the firmware to be loaded is um, uh, 300 in hex. And you can see that uh, during the switch startup. Since I didn't uh, see any code whatsoever uh, when I fire up my IDA, um, there's actually a very nice script by a guy called Federico, and uh, he created a script for IDA that automatically recognizes all the function, um, and it's actually cross-platform, so if you have like one or two functions already recognized manually, it just sweeps uh, through all the code and recognizes the other one with the same prolog. So it looks something like that. You just specify the most common prologs for a function, and we'll just loop and discover all the functions. So this helped me to discover like 90 or 97 percent of all the function, which was enough. Well, of course, um, firmware, there are no symbols whatsoever, um, and uh, Cisco IOS uh, operating system is basically uh, a single binary. Uh, and uh, even when you're looking through the code, it's kind of difficult, kind of difficult to follow because there are lots of places where the functions are called indirectly. Uh, the call tables are filled at runtime and it doesn't uh, make it easier to follow the control flow um, in static. So of course, uh, since we are, have problems with static analysis, we have to set up a debug environment. Uh, and there are some problems with that. Uh, first of all, of course, there's no uh, development kit for Cisco. Um, although, although the switch itself has a GDB kernel command, which is um, actual GDB server with a slightly uh, customized protocol. So the problem is that new GDB client versions uh, do not support this. Uh, there is a manual on the internet how to build an old version of GDB. Uh, for it to work with a Cisco router or switch. Um, the other option is to use a debugger created by NCC group, it's called iAdit, it's pretty good. And there's some people who actually built an um, IDA adapter for, to debug iOS, but I didn't find it in public. So, I started up with GDB. I opened the manual and uh, patched it, so what did I get? Well almost nothing. I was able to read uh, and write uh, memory on the switch, but that's all. I wasn't able to run uh, the firmware, I wasn't able to uh, put a breakpoint anywhere. So, guys, I resorted to the last possible option. I did. <laughs> it was kind of smooth experience, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, this this uh, debugger, I think it was built for some um, very na narrow uh, models of routers. It had some user line code that um, requested information from the router, like process list and uh, router configuration, and the switches output different um, um, different formats. So the um, the debug debugger was crashing all the time, and I had to um, 
really debug it and cut out um, lots of user land functionality to get it working. But nonetheless, it did work for uh, debugging the kernel of iOS. Not too long ago, uh, not too long ago, like a couple of weeks ago, I stumbled upon this pic comparing Windows debugger and AliDB debugger. Well, this how I felt uh, when I was debugging using iAdit, you know. But you know. Heads off to NCC Group. This is still the best tool available to debug iOS. So, so now to the actual meat of presentation, the actual vulnerability um, that uh, Cisco systems encounter. And I started with uh, looking for strings in the firmware. They were all recognized. Um, it was uh, easy to get them. And uh, remember that shrink in the in the dump and also in the failed output uh, in the Vault 7 leak? This is it. I started with it. So I got some cross references uh, to this string and it led me to one particular uh, interesting uh, function which is, uh, I called it, called Cisco Kids. And it was uh, actually um, doing, what it was doing, it was parsing this uh, custom uh, magic string and there was a vulnerability in it. And because the telnet code is rather symmetrical, the code for parsing, um, uh, for sending the string and the code for parsing the string was uh, really near and um, it helped a lot. So uh, this might be a little bit difficult to process, but this is the client portion uh, that sends this magic telnet option and we, ca we can see that it is managed by a format string, um, which is uh, some byte, then a string, then a byte, then an integer, then we get another string between the two columns and we get an um, integer. Matches perfectly the string uh, that I was uh, looking at um, in the Wireshark. So, uh, Let's look at the code that actually receives this magic option and parses it. Um, I stumbled upon this code. So it basically reads the first byte, uh, reads the integer, reads the Cisco kit string, and then it reads uh, the string that is uh, between the columns. And funny enough, there are no boundary check, no length check whatsoever, and it's just read until the next column guys, what does this look like? To me it sounded like a classic overflow. So, so uh, yeah, I had an overflow, it's a absolutely classic one. Um, instead of sending an empty string between uh, two columns, I, you know, wrote some capital A's because capital A's mean business. <laughs> And we can see at the bottom of the slide that the power counter, uh, program counter is um, actually like an EIP for Intel platforms. It's um, instruction pointers. We can see the capital A's in there. So uh, we now are in control of uh, program counter. This is how our flow looked uh, in the debugger. We see that uh, stack is overflowing with uh, the capital A's. Um, and uh, we see that um, the current uh, instruction is BLR, which is a PowerPC for branch to link register. And um, what it does, it checks the link register, which is, you can see is 41, 41, 41, 41, and branches to it. So it jumps right to um, the data we had sent to the switch. The stack, so the PowerPC stack frame is uh, kind of the same as Intel. Uh, in a way, we have uh, local variables um, up above the return address. So if one of the local variables is a buffer and the boundary is in a check, we of course have a, we have a problem. Execution will be controlled by user supplied input. So now, uh, what do we do after we, you know, send some capital A? Of course we generate some cyclic pattern. Uh, cyclic pattern is a way to determine the exact location where we actually overflow the program counter. Um, it works in a way that uh, every four bytes in a buffer are unique. So when you uh, overflow with cyclic pattern, you just read uh, the contents of program counter. You fit it up to a special method that recognizes uh, this tiny four byte portions of uh, buffer and 
This method uh, gets you the offset of the buffer that overflows problem count. I use spawn tools for this. It's a great uh, uh, framework for pwning stuff. and also has the uh, ability to generate cyclic patterns. So it works kind of like this. You just generate a string for about 200 symbols. Um, you create a payload uh, with this uh, magic telnet option. You send it. And again, when the switch crashed, I observed the value of D8 uh, AD uh, in ASCII, which is, uh, you see how it is in hex. You just feed, feed this up to the cyclic uh, find method, and we get that the actual program counter is uh, overflown at offset 150. All right. And guys, this really looked uh, too easy because uh, actually the R9, uh, so the PowerPC has. Um, 30, 31 uh, general purpose registers, and the R9 register at the time of overflow was pointing at uh, our buffer. So it, was, it looked too easy, so we just have to put our shellcode at the um, address pointing by R9, and, and no bad charts were in place whatsoever. Okay then, uh, here's a screenshot from uh, I did. So you see the R9, um, you see the R9 register being uh, uh, pointing to our buffer. So, we have to find a gadget in memory that just jumps to R9, and it is uh, here on the screen. So, it's kind of easy. You just load the R9 register to a special CTR re register. The second instruction is garbage. We don't need it. And then we branch to CTR uh, register. So, this way, we just jump to uh, R9. Um, what could possibly go wrong? You know, jump into shell code is always fun, but no. Um, access exception again, so I failed again. The device actually rebooted. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I didn't know why. So it seemed to me that heap and the stack were not executable. Why did that happen? Is this actually uh, the data execution prevention? Honestly, guys, I still don't know. But there's been uh, talks on um, on this matter before, and one of them was really good at uh, Black Hat, not not so long ago, by uh, Felix FX, and he actually suggested that uh, this might happen because of uh, instruction and data caching in PowerPC. Uh, here's a slide from his presentation. PowerPC has a cache for data and instructions. So what happens when we write some data to stack or heap actually and then transfer uh, execution control to this data? Uh, when we transfer the execution control data uh, to, to this data, there's actually no data there because the data we just wrote is in the cache. So this uh, might be the reason why it's not working. So in the end, we are not able to execute code. Code. So what do we do? Our last resort is return-oriented programming, of course. Uh, what is it? It is it's a generic technique used in uh, exploitation to uh, bypass uh, data execution prevention. In our case, it's a way to bypass instruction and uh, data caching, and it works um, this way. We we don't write our own code uh, to stack or heap. We are reusing the code and uh, in the binary or in my case uh, in uh, firmware, we use uh, the stack uh, as a source of data for those instructions and we um, chain these little snippets of code in, uh, in such a way so we can uh, perform um, our needed actions. And those might be either, let's say, arbitrary reads arbitrary writes, and then when we're done, we are transferring the con uh, execution control flow back uh, to, uh, to the original uh, function. So uh, the, each gadget, each candidate gadget has uh, to meet at least two conditions. So it must execute some payload, uh, either read or write, uh, and also it has uh, to have some code that is uh, transferring uh, execution flow to the next gadget. And uh, there's some limitation to this approach. Uh, only, of course, you are as good as uh, the number of gadgets that are in firmware. Uh, and there's a limited set of them. And uh, when you're actually ch chaining them up 
every gadget is a modifying stack in a way because mostly we use um, function uh, epilogues as gadgets and they all work with stacks. So when they move a uh, stack around and this might corrupt a stack frame that is um, below your uh, stack frame that the, and this uh, is tricky and, cre and creates problems. We can accomplish um, basically uh, two things with uh, return oriented. Uh, either arbitrary writes uh, and this uh, might lead to arbitrary code execution. So my idea was um, um, to create an arbitrary memory write primitive. The idea is quite simple. Uh, we have a find, uh, we find a code snippet uh, in the firmware uh, that takes value from the, uh, two values from the stack. One value is, um, is the memory address uh, we want to write to, and the other uh, value is the actual value we're writing. Uh, so for example, um, we load uh, memory address at register R30 and the value to register R31. And then we uh, chain to the next gadget, which actually performs the write. So, yeah, I've been talking about it already. So, typical gadget uh, looks like this. It's a function epilogue. It does stuff with... Uh, with, stack, with data on stack and then it uh, jumps. So the LWZ uh, opcodes are for loading data and the last opcode BLR is actually to jump uh, out of the function. So I'm going to be talking about the write primitives uh, that I used to actually uh, get this exploit working. This is the actual gadget I'm using in the original uh, proof of concept I released uh, not too long ago. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, with the gadget, we have to set up um, our um, the address of the next gadget. So we do this by loading uh, data from stack to register R0 and then uh, loading um, the R0 register into the link register. And you remember I told you that link register is used for branching. Next thing we do, we load uh, the address we want to write to from, uh, from the stack. And stack is pointed by register R1 in PowerPC. We load this into R30. We load the actual value to R31. Uh, side effect from a gadget like this, it moves the stack uh, a bit, like uh, 10 in hex, and then we branch to the value we put in R0. That's it. We have two registers with an address and a value to write, and we, we chain to the second gadget, which is, um, uses opcode store value, and it, it writes uh, the value of R31 to R30. And this, our base, this is our basic write primitive. So it consists of two gadgets, uh, the loading and the writing. And the result is, is we just wrote arbitrary data to arbitrary address. It is easier to do this with um, uh, automatic tools. This um, wrapper tool is really good. It uh, kind of semi-automates uh, the process of building uh, gadgets. You can look up, you can lo uh, load a binary of firmware in it and uh, uh, look uh, for gadgets uh, with um, search and wildcards. Okay, so we have, uh, basically have uh, the ability to write arbitrary data into the firmware how do we get uh, code execution from it? Uh, the plan is to find some place, some uh, critical place in uh, the firmware uh, which we can patch and that will result in code execution. So you can patch the control flow that actually uh, checks uh, the credentials. You can um, patch some uh, telnet uh, inner structs that are used for authentication or you might look for some function pointers that uh, return uh, critical data related to authenticating you on the switch. Well, I thought, why not patch the execution flow? So looking further down the code, um, where the switch is um, authenticating you, I just decided to patch this if branch. Well, uh, instead of if and all of those conditions, I, I just uh, put it like if true. And guys, it looked like it worked, but you know, again, 
this only worked under debugger. <laughs> the exception was triggered uh, during the live setup and uh, you know, I was kind of desperate at that moment. Uh, I kept on looking and uh, a couple of, uh, I'd say days, you know, uh, I was looking at this code and something, you know, uh, catched. And uh, yeah, lots of code on this slide and what's interesting is the first uh, line which is a uh, indirect call for a function uh, that I named uh, is cluster mode. And uh, it is in indirect which means that it's not called directly, it's um, being referenced uh, by a memory location and this memory location has the actual address of the function. So uh, the second interesting thing is that uh, there was another function down the code that was called indirectly and it's called uh, get privilege level. And uh, also, it was reference, references uh, by memory location. And uh, so long story short, uh, both uh, of these functions uh, are referenced indirectly uh, and we can apply uh, right primitives to them to change this memory location. By, but, but the question is, why are these functions uh, important? And they are important because uh, if uh, the function class is cluster mode, uh, returns something that is not um, zero, then we go down the branch which checks your privilege level and that is the only check you need to get a privilege 15 shell in iOS. So if we patch is cluster mode um, with uh, non-zero and then we patch uh, the pointer to get privilege level with uh, like function that always returns 15, we can see here, uh, it's a PowerPC snippet, that if our privilege level is uh, not minus one, we're just presented with a shell. Okay. So, uh, easy enough. Um, we will actually take uh, this pointer, uh, pop up IDA Pro, look for a function that returns something that is uh, not zero, one, fifteen, doesn't matter. We will take the uh, get privilege level um, pointer over, overwritten with the function that always returns fifteen. Um, the firmware actually ha had those functions so it was, was pretty easy to find. And uh, all we have to do now is uh, find suitable gadgets to make the necessary writes. So the first gadget, I was already talking about it. Um, it's just loading up information, uh, I mean uh, data from stack. Um, we take the pointer to is cluster mode function. We take uh, the value we want to override it with and that is the address of a function that always returns one. Um, we add to the stack pointer and we make a branch to the next gadget. Uh, the address for this gadget we already set up uh, during the first two uh, upcodes as you see. So loading the R0 register and loading R0 to link register. Second gadget does the write. Uh, so the first upcode uh, gets two registers, uh, gets R30 and gets R31 and writes to the location referenced by R30. Okay, so now we have overwritten the is cluster mode, it always returns uh, a non-zero value so we go down the branch that uh, checks the privilege. It's uh, kind of more tricky with the second write because uh, it actually needs two dereferences. But guys, uh, this did work. And finally, finally, I was presented with the level 15 uh, iOS shell on the switch. Now, you know that it's demo time. I hope the, I'll check if the inter internet works. If not, I'll just uh, show you the video.
topic and we'll That's actually SSH connection to my lab, so it's uh, not too fast, and I can't really see what I'm doing, but I'll try. So, thirty-eight point ten. So yeah, we have a Cisco switch on uh, on this IP address, and we can actually see that um, there's a password problem, right? We type in some basic stuff like Cisco, Cisco, it doesn't work. All right. So, to the exploit itself. Can't really see what I'm typing. All right. It's good. So, the option, uh, options are pretty easy. So you just uh, specify the host and you set. I'm not sure if it worked because uh, there are some problems with timings, but I will check. All right. Is there a shell? Yes, there is. So you can actually see the version of firmware. You can also see that um, we have a oh, show priv, right? Yeah, we have a, a privilege 15 shell. So what's good about this exploit is that we can easily unset this. So instead of set, we just go with the, let's see. Two dashes, I don't see. Okay. We go with onset, and yes, it goes back to its original state. <laughs> right, back to the, well, it's good demo gods were happy with me, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's the video one needed. So, side notes, I, I do pen test a lot, so I've encountered um, many of those switches um, on pen tests and successfully exploited uh, several of them. And what helps with this, this uh, exploit is actually um, very firmware specific because offsets are uh, different from uh, firmware to firmware. And what helps to determine the version as two, is uh, two protocols, SNMP and CDP. SNMP, if you guess a public or a private string, uh, you're able to dump the firmware version and that helps you to develop, a, to customize the exploit. Or if you're in the same L2 physical uh, broadcast network as the switch, uh, you can listen for CDP requests. They also uh, give information about this uh, version of the switch. So this helps a lot. So in a matter of like uh, one or two hours, you can find um, you can you can customize your exploit and get a shell on the on the on the switch. So about further research, uh, of course, I managed to do only arbitrary writes um, on this switch. It would be good to be able to run an arbitrary shell code instead of, instead of just modifying memory. Um, and also, it would be really good to actually automate the process of building ROP gadgets because it's kind of a tedious process and um, you know, the first time it's fun but not so much uh, when you do it like a tense time. And again, um, I just thought about not like a week ago, what if uh, we know that switches are, cluster, uh, are using clustering uh, via the CDP protocol and uh, I'm almost sure but not 100% sure that there is no authentication in place when they're uh, sending this telnet um, clustering between them. And we also know that the master switch can easily get the um, privilege 15 shell on the slave switch. But what if uh, we are in the same broadcast uh, uh, segment and we just build a CDP packet that uh, tells uh, the other switch that we are a switch and then we craft an, a, a layer two telnet connection uh, requesting a 
Privilege 15 shell with our command. What will happen? Well, this actually reminds to be, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, I'm working on it. It's an ongoing research and, um, you know, stuff to think for you guys. Thank you so much for your time. You can check the proof of concept code uh, on GitHub. Um, contributions, of course, are welcome. Thank you so much.